One of the most meaningful aspects of providing care is the satisfaction that comes from contributing to your client's well-being. Food can give a real sense of comfort and connection to older adults. Skillful meal planning and preparation are very valuable services. Enjoyment of good food in a friendly setting has a positive effect on happiness and well-being. Studies have shown that when older people are isolated at mealtime, they often become depressed and lose interest in eating, which leads to a decline in health. Your presence and care can help make meals a pleasant time for your clients, improving their well-being and overall health. Older adults absorb fewer nutrients from foods they eat, and the ability to digest fats decreases with age. Older adults need fewer calories to maintain body weight. The daily number of total calories for people over 70 should be between 1,200 to 1,600. Calorie needs decline by 25% for people over 70, yet protein needs remain constant or increase. Decreased ability to smell or taste food illness, certain medications, and normal aging can lead to loss of appetite. Older people may not eat well because of dementia, illness, inability to shop and prepare foods, or loneliness. Instead of eating a variety of healthy foods, they may snack on high sugar, high fat, or high salt foods. These habits can lead to nutritional deficiencies or even malnutrition. For these reasons, it is important that older adults eat a diet full of fresh, healthy, unprocessed foods. Nutrition experts at Tufts University developed a new version of the food pyramid with dietary recommendations for people over 70. This food pyramid can be a helpful tool as you plan meals for your clients. As the pyramid shows, the foods that provide the best diet for older people are whole grains and cereals, bright or deeply colored vegetables and fruits, beans and nuts, low-fat dairy products, lean meat, fish, poultry, and eggs. Dietary recommendations are often described in servings. People no longer know what a healthy serving size is because often foods are served in supersized portions. Visual images can help you learn correct serving sizes. For example, one serving of meat or fish is three ounces, about the size of a deck of cards. For a green salad or raw vegetables, a serving is one cup, about the size of two hands cupped. One serving of cooked beans, rice, or pasta is a half a cup, about the size of one hand cupped. If the person eats one cup of beans, rice, or pasta, he or she has had two servings. Many foods come in one half cup serving sizes. These include cooked vegetables, cooked cereal, but cold cereal is three quarter cup for one serving, cottage cheese, pudding, mashed potatoes that include milk and butter, starchy vegetables including sweet potatoes, squash, and corn. One portion of cheese is two ounces, about the size of two dominoes. For some foods, such as peanut butter, salad dressing, and mayonnaise, a serving is one tablespoon. Each day, your client should have eaten six ounces of protein. So during the day, you might serve your client one three-ounce serving of meat or fish, as well as an egg, a half serving of beans, and one serving of nuts, to complete the six ounce protein requirement. Two to three servings of low fat dairy products, one serving is eight ounces, one and a half to two cups of bright colored cooked vegetables, a serving is a half a cup, two to four servings of fruit each day, one serving of fruit can be one medium apple, orange, or a half of banana, a half a cup of chopped, cooked, or canned fruit, or a half a cup of fruit juice. six or more servings of whole grains and cereals per day. You may be providing two servings at a meal. For example, one serving of bread typically equals one slice of bread. So if you serve a sandwich, you have provided two servings. In addition, your client should have eight, 
eight ounce glasses of water and other liquids each day. Older people often lose their sense of thirst and do not drink enough water. This can lead to serious health problems. In order to assure that your clients drink enough water each day, encourage them to drink by providing water and other liquids to them often. Have a pitcher of water in the refrigerator that you encourage them to finish each day. We call certain foods comfort foods because they reassure us. Some foods are particularly enjoyable because they remind us of family or the place we think of as home. A care provider's goal is to supply the best nutrition possible in an appealing way. Prepare the kinds of foods your client prefers rather than the foods you prefer. If you are not acquainted with the types of food your client prefers, ask your client or a family member for some recipe suggestions or a cookbook. Good meal planning saves time and money and promotes health with meals that are appetizing, varied, and nutritious. Plan meals for a one-week period. When developing menus, pay attention to the total number of calories in the meal and its nutritional value. When planning meals, a simple book that lists the calories, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and sodium for different foods can be helpful. Generally, the total daily calories for people over 70 should be between 1,200 to 1,600. Including a variety of foods is important for good health. Different foods contain a variety of different nutrients, and variety adds color and texture to the meal. Use the Food Guide Pyramid for older adults as a guide when planning meals. Even with a limited food budget, it's possible to create tasty, nutritious meals. For example, you can make a nutritious meal with a couple of eggs, some whole grain toast, and a piece of fruit or carrot. The fiber in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains promotes good health and elimination. For example, fresh fruits and vegetables provide 2 to 8 grams of fiber per 1 cup serving. True whole grain bread contains at least 2 grams of fiber per serving. Use breads labeled whole wheat or cracked wheat. Be aware that breads labeled simply wheat or enriched wheat may not contain whole grains and are far less healthy. Food that is high in fiber is usually lower in calories. For example, one cup of cooked whole wheat spaghetti has 6 grams of fiber and 170 calories while the same amount of enriched spaghetti has only 2 grams of fiber but 200 calories. Legumes such as chickpeas, pinto beans and lentils offer 5 to 7 grams of fiber per half cup serving. A high fiber diet includes 20 to 35 grams of fiber daily. Older adults may be following diets prescribed by their doctors, such as low-fat, low-sodium, or a diabetic diet. If your client is not following the prescribed diet, or if you notice a change in his or her appetite, report your observation to your supervisor. Any medically prescribed diet requires special attention in shopping and cooking. Sometimes um, a doctor will order for someone to be on a low salt diet and generally what that is is between 2,000 and 3,000 milligrams of sodium per day. Now sodium, when a, the difference between sodium and salt is that salt is made up of sodium chloride. So that's the two you know, different compounds, but sodium is actually the compound that will contribute to raising someone's blood pressure. And so that's the one that we want to watch. So um, if you were on a 3,000 milligram diet, an easy way to remember that is just that you want to have about 1,000 milligrams per meal. And um, a lot of people that aren't familiar with the metric system, that makes them nervous. 
but you really don't need to be because on labels, um, sodium is always in milligrams. So to follow a low salt diet, you wanna to try to eat as little processed foods as you can, but a lot of times older people are going to need to use some of those processed foods. So you have to you know, figure out how to work them in and pick the lower, the lower convenience foods that have sodium. But you, in general, you wanna to try to stay away from or limit things like canned uh, soup, um, TV dinners, um, teriyaki sauce, soy sauce, um, the salt shaker. One teaspoon of salt has about 2,300 milligrams of sodium, which is almost as much as your daily total. Rather than adding salt for flavoring, use seasonings such as lemon juice or vinegar, or herbs such as basil, garlic, oregano, and sage to flavor foods. If your doctor wants your client to follow um, a heart healthy diet, usually that, what that consists of is a total of no more than 40 to 60 grams of fat a day, depending off, on if you're a man or a woman, and generally not more than 15 to 17 grams of saturated fat, if you were looking at that more closely. Saturated fat is the main fat that contributes to um, uh, heart problems, heart attacks, and strokes. And that's found on the label right underneath total fat. And um, like I said, you don't want to have more than about 15 to 18 grams of saturated fat a day. And it's in foods like um, cream, whole milk, fatty red meat, butter, ice cream. Doesn't mean you can't have those foods, but you should be eating a limited amount of those foods because they do have a lot of saturated fat, even including cheese. Trans fats, the recommended limo, limit for trans fats, and that's found right underneath saturated fat on the label, the recommended limit is actually zero a day. So um, you wanna try to avoid trans fats in most foods because those are not considered heart healthy either. Foods that have trans fats would be like stick margarine, um, donuts, fast food, uh, some forms of Crisco, and they're really trying in the food industry to remove the trans fats from food because they know that they're not heart healthy. The most heart healthy of the uh, fats on the label would be monounsaturated fats and also a fat called um, omega-3s, which is a type of polyunsaturated fat. And um, simply put, omega-3s um, are the fat that's found in fish. So fish is really healthy for your um, clients. And um, also things like spinach and flaxseed and walnuts, they have a lot of the good types of fat. And you can even include things like shrimp and shellfish up to a couple times a week which also has omega-3s, but it has a little more cholesterol, so we limit those. Basically, a heart-healthy a heart healthy diet is a diet that's really rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and fish and, and some nuts and lean meats, chicken, fish, beef. And we recommend that your client doesn't have red meat more than twice a week, even if it's lean. And the leaner cuts of red meat would uh, red meat would be rump roast, round, loin, sirloin, and that's a good rule to remember. If it has the word loin or sirloin, it's generally leaner, as opposed to like chuck or T-bone or ribs or sausage. Those are fattier red meats and contain a lot more saturated fat. To decrease fat in the diet, use low-fat or non-fat milk for drinking and cooking. Bake food instead of frying. Trim fat from meat before cooking. Add less fat or oil to food. Eat less processed foods. Limit restaurant eating to one to two times per week. If the doctor has your client on a diabetic diet, um, one of the most confusing things that people um, do is they look at the sugars on the label, but we would actually want you to look at the total carbohydrates on the label. And generally, someone would get between like 150 and 200 grams of total carbohydrate per day. But an easy way to remember it is that most people are on between 45 and 60 grams of carb per meal. So a lot of times people, when they think, when their client's on a diabetic diet, they try to make it um, too strict or they look at sugars. The, on the sugar line, that's actually included in the total carbohydrate. So if an apple had a label, it would actually say 15 grams of sugar on the sugar line. 
So you can't go by the sugar line. You want to go by the total carbohydrate line. And a good rule of thumb is if one food has more than about 30 grams of total carbohydrate, it's starting to get a little bit too high. So um, things that we generally recommend diabetics don't eat. Um, they can have most foods in small portions, but we recommend they do not drink regular soda pop because that's 49 grams of carbohydrate in one can, and that's as much as you should be having at a meal. And the other thing is regular table syrup because, again, that's about 49 grams of carbohydrate in a quarter of a cup, and you put it on pancakes, which is another carbohydrate. So that ends up being just way too much um, carbohydrates for that meal. Many foods, such as baked goods, candy, sugar-coated cereals, and chips, make them unhealthy because refined sugar has been added. Refined sugar comes in various forms, including dextrose, fructose, glucose, sucrose, or high-fructose corn syrup. Foods high in refined sugar should be avoided. Older adults have a higher risk of malnutrition than the rest of the population. Malnutrition weakens the immune system, increasing the risk of pneumonia and other serious infections. It can also contribute to mental confusion. Warning signs of malnutrition include an illness that affects the type or amount of food eaten, eating less than two meals per day, not eating a balanced diet, drinking three or more alcoholic beverages daily, tooth or mouth problems that make it hard to eat, eating alone most of the time, unintentional weight gain or loss of 10 or more pounds in the past six months, the inability to shop, cook, or feed oneself, change in the appearance of the skin or sores on the skin. Some solutions for malnutrition are quite simple. Make meal social events. This may be the most important step in curbing malnutrition. Older people's eating clearly improves when they have company. Vary the texture, color, and temperature of foods. Plan healthy between meal snacks. A piece of fruit or cheese, a spoonful of peanut butter on a cracker, or a blended smoothie that includes a banana can add nutrients and calories. Encourage regular exercise. Exercise stimulates appetite and helps lift depression. Serve foods that contain more protein and calories. Add liquid nutrition such as Ensure and Boost if needed. Healthy eating starts with healthy shopping. Check food items already in the house against your menu ingredients. Then create a shopping list that matches your client's dietary restrictions, food preferences, and food budget. Purchase as many fresh, unprocessed items as possible. Choose fresh fruits and vegetables that are in season to add variety and keep costs down. Fresh fruits, vegetables, and whole grains should form the bulk of the diet. Labels on packaged food items provide information about the food's ingredients and nutritional values. Learning to read the labels on food products is a valuable skill, especially in choosing healthy foods for your client. Labels on meat and fish list the date on which the item was packed and the date it must be sold. Other types of packaged foods such as dairy products, cereals, and main dishes may have additional dates such as best if used by or an expiration date. The label will also show the list of ingredients used. The first ingredient listed is highest in quantity and the last ingredient is the lowest. Before you purchase products, check their expiration dates and choose items with the longest time before expiration. Probably some of the most important things on the food label are the serving size and the servings per container. A lot of times now if you have um, a smaller size container, they may call that two servings where we would eat it and call it one. So the, all the information on the label is according to what they're calling a portion size on the label. So if they say a portion size is three quarters of a cup, all the information is going to be for three quarters of a cup, all the calories, the fat. If we eat a cup and a half, then we would need to double the, the, all the calories and the fat and the sodium and the cholesterol. 
Um, so some of the important things on the label are the calories. I always look at the calories because um, like when people are on like a low carb diet, they forget that calories are still a big issue. So they try to watch carbohydrates, and but they might be eating 300 calories and something. So we always look at the calories. Um, I don't really pay attention to the percentages on the right hand side because the percentages are for people that are on 2,000 to 2,500 calories and most of your clients aren't going to be on that. So really I just almost even X those out. But we would want to pay attention to the left hand side um, total grams of fat are important. Um, remember the goal is to try to stay between 40 and 60, closer to 40 with women, 40 to 45 with women, and closer to 60 for men. Saturated fat, it's got the grams of saturated fat. You want to stay between 15 and 18 grams of saturated fat. Trans fats, you want to stay mostly close to zero. Cholesterol, we didn't talk about that at all, but 200 to 300 milligrams of cholesterol per day is what uh, an average goal. Sodium would be about 3,000 milligrams per day. Um, carbohydrate will vary depending on if you're diabetic or not. Um, fiber, we want to try to stay around 25 grams of fiber a day, which is, is hard to get that much in. I'll just tell you, most of your clients will probably not get in 25 grams of fiber. Okay. Protein, um, for every seven grams of protein on a label, we would consider that equivalent to an ounce of meat. Unit pricing, which is often found below the product on the grocery shelf, gives the cost of items in ounces or pounds. It makes it easier to compare the cost of various products. For example, giant or family size containers do not always end up costing less than smaller containers. Unit pricing helps you to compare the cost. Shop for items that need refrigeration just before you head to the checkout and store them as soon as you reach the client's home. To provide a record for your client and agency, record the date, the total amount you've spent on groceries and other items in a logbook. Save all the receipts. It is important to follow established safety procedures when handling food. Food poisoning can occur if food is not stored, handled, or cooked properly. Food poisoning can be fatal, especially for children and older adults. There are four core practices in safe food handling. The first is cleanliness. Wash your hands well in warm soapy water for at least 20 seconds before and after handling food. If possible, cut meat on an acrylic or plastic cutting board that can be thrown into the dishwasher or soapy hot water. Keep all kitchen surfaces clean. Wash cutting boards, dishes, countertops, and utensils with hot soapy water. Wash dishcloths and towels frequently in the hot cycle of the washing machine. Sponges are not recommended for use in the kitchen because their texture and dampness harbors germs. Don't cross-contaminate. When handling raw meat, poultry, or seafood, keep these foods and their juices away from other foods. Use one cutting board for fresh produce and a separate one for raw meat, poultry, and seafood. Do not use a knife that has just cut raw meat to cut fruits and vegetables. Preparation and cooking. Never thaw food on the countertop. Thaw food in the refrigerator. Marinate foods in the refrigerator as well. Use a meat thermometer to make sure that meats are cooked to the recommended temperature. If cooked meats are not eaten within three to four days, they should be discarded. It is important to refrigerate leftovers as soon as possible. Foods should not be out of the refrigerator for more than two hours. If the temperature is 80 degrees or higher, Return food to the refrigerator in less than an hour. Recipes make it easier to cook dishes because they include the number of servings the recipe will make, the time needed to cook the dish, a list of ingredients needed, and step-by-step -step directions for preparing the dish. Recipes often use abbreviations here are some of the most common abbreviations. T or TSP equals teaspoon. A capital T 
or capital TBSP, equals tablespoon. C equals one cup. OZ equals an ounce. PT equals a pint. QT is one quart. The pound sign, or LB, equals one pound. And DOZ equals one dozen. To measure ingredients correctly, you will need three types of measuring devices. Glass or clear plastic measuring cups are used for measuring liquid ingredients, such as milk, water, or oils. They come in various sizes. Metal or plastic measuring cups usually come in a set of various sizes and are used to measure dry or solid ingredients, such as flour, nuts, and shredded cheese. When the cup is full, use a knife or spatula to make the ingredient level with the top of the cup. Measuring spoons are used to measure small amounts of liquid or dry ingredients. The ingredient should be level with the top of the spoon. Welcome, my name is Josh Hobson. I'm an instructor here at Oregon Culinary Institute. We're going to show a couple of different basic cooking methods and cutting procedures just to help you out in the kitchen. So one of the things that we wanted to start off with is showing you why we do different cooking and cutting methods uh, for different reasons. So one thing that we have here is a couple different things as far as like chopping and we also have a slicing and one of the major things that this is going to affect is how it's cooked it's going to affect the flavor that is actually infused and then how long it's cooked along with the appearance. So if I'm making a soup, uh, you maybe not want pieces that are this big because all I'm going to taste is one big bite of zucchini. Whereas I might have something a little bit smaller, like a smaller dice, that would give me more variety when I'm actually eating the soup. So slices like this would definitely cook a little faster. This is going to be easier to saute. Uh, so these are things that we can work with um, fairly simple and easily. To chop is to basically cut uh, fairly large pieces and I always get asked how do you cut an onion? And so I'm going to show you how to cut an onion. So we're going to take the top portion off right here, just a small amount, and then the bottom root end portion here as well. Now what I have is a nice flat surface that can actually sit on the table. Now we're going to cut this in half and this allows me to peel it much easier and much better. It's easier this way than trying to peel a whole onion and the peel comes off much better in one piece. Now to chop, this onion is already sliced up for you. We actually, nature already took care of that for us. It's already got these nice slices here for you. So what we want to do is use this to our advantage. And what I'm going to do here is just take my knife and I'm actually going to, again, just kind of cut into this, but I don't want to cut all the way through. So I'm going to cut all the way down, leaving a little section on the end that I'm not cutting. So this is all still attached right here. And so what we're going to do is, again, just keep on going around and I'm angling my knife to kind of match what we're doing there. Next, I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees and then start cutting it the other direction. And because of the natural space in the onion and the natural way it's folded, it comes apart and this would be chopped. Next we're going to dice and to dice is basically to, uh, we're going to cut it down into square pieces and try and keep it as uniform as possible. Just going to take a nice little round there, cut it right up and we're going for again just nice square pieces, fairly uniform. Don't worry if you can't get it exactly uniform. Most people aren't really going to notice. And what we'll do is again, same kind of idea, we're going for a smaller dice though this time. So I'm just going to cut much smaller sections here. And then again, I'm going to line it up and go the other direction here. And so what I'm going to end up with is a much smaller dice Good for soups, maybe a stir fry, maybe a sauteed up vegetable, something very similar. So again, just kind of mince it, mash it just like this, and then it's ready to go. You could just take your knife, hold on to one end of this, and then just take it right back through. 
multiple times and you can get it as small as you want. Typically with garlic, we don't really want large pieces of garlic. This is a peeled cucumber. I'm gonna take the end off here. And then what I'm gonna do is just take about a good couple inches, inch and a half, somewhere around there. And what I'm gonna do is just take very thin slices, again, just like we were cutting before for any of the dicing or chopping, and then come back and make nice, long, slender pieces. So with here, what we end up with is a beautiful julienne. And what we're looking for is very, very similar to what the julienne, the very thin slice. So I'm gonna cut this in half just so it's easier to work with. And then what I wanna do is just set this up and just very thin cuts so think very similar to what you would find in like coleslaw or maybe a braised cabbage dish. This is a lot of times what we call for shredding. And what you want to do is just hold on to this or else lay it flat. We're going to take a product like potatoes. This would be good for like hash browns or uh, something else in that matter. And then just run it down along the blades. So what we're looking for is a nice grate. So this would be your grated potato. You can also do it on a smaller end, which will give you a much finer grate. Depending on what you're looking for. So these would be good for, again, hash browns or some sort of other breakfast item. The next term we want to focus on is what's called to whip. Um, and especially with eggs, a lot of times you'll see it referred to as beating. So beating eggs or whipping eggs, perfectly fine. What we're going to use is what's called a whisk, which is, again, just a, you could use a fork as well or anything else. And we're going to break up the egg yolks just a little bit. And then the whipping motion is actually a turning so that it's kind of coming from the bottom and just whipping in a little bit of air. So we want to mix in as much air as possible to this. So this would be, again, whipping or beating either term. To steam is basically cooking over uh, boiling water and so that all we're using is just that steam uh, to uh, cook the vegetables that we're going to have here. I've got some broccoli. I've got a pan that's set up here and this is actually a steaming pan. So this is set up specifically just to steam. And what we've got here is a lid, and you really want to be careful with steaming. Uh, taking the lid on and off, steam burns hurt fairly uh, bad. So always kind of rotate it away from yourself. Don't make sure that your hand is above there. And what we have below this here is what we refer to as a perforated pan. So this pan has a bunch of holes, and then we have some boiling water just below it. So all we do for steaming, place the vegetables in. You want to make sure that they're spread out so that the air and the moisture can get around them so that it's not too crowded. You don't want to have too much product sitting in there at once. Then we place the lid on it and we steam it for the amount of time that it says in the recipe. To saute is to use very high heat, very small amount of fat, and to keep the product moving. So saute actually literally refers to actually jumping. So with this, we're gonna do some vegetables. I'm also gonna show you how to saute some meat as well. Now, one of the first important things is to heat your pan first. Always let your pan get fairly warm. I've actually had these heating for a minute or so now. And so we wanna have fairly warm pans, and to that, we're gonna add the oil. So for meat, small amount of oil in the pan. This is maybe about a tablespoon or two. I've got some pork cutlets. So you really want to, if you're going to saute, very thin cut of meat, very slender cut of meat, and then we're just going to lay it in. Now when you hear that sound, that's a saute. You want to move it around and you want to keep it moving. This is going to be on very high heat. You want to make sure it continues to move. I'm going to throw in some zucchini. One of the very important things that you want to do with this is to make sure that you don't overcrowd the pan. So, it should always still hear that nice sizzling going on. Now, with stir frying, we're actually going to use a Chinese cooking instrument called a wok, 
which is going to allow, it's a little bit more rounded, it's a little bit more deeper, and the size of it and the shape of it actually allows the heat to come up around it and give much more uniform cooking to the whole entire process. So step one is to pop in some aromatics. Again, this is our minced garlic or minced ginger. You should hear this nice sizzling to it. And then with this, the minute you can smell it, I'm talking literally 30 seconds, we're going to put in some nicely sliced meat here. And this is chicken. All of it very thinly sliced, so that's going to cook very fast. So this chicken is almost all the way cooked. My next step into this is vegetables. Now when you add vegetables at home, these burners are fairly hot here. So I can add quite a few at a time. And again, you want to mix it up, you want to be able to toss it around a little bit or else again, keep mixing with your spoon. So we let this cook for just a second longer. Then you have your nice, beautiful stir fry. So baking here is basically cooking anything in an oven. Roasting is the same way. It's just going to be depend. Roasting typically refers to meat. Baking typically refers to bread or pastry items that you might see. So we just place these right on the rack. If you like to add extra aromatics to it, you can always put things underneath, like a little bit of herbs or something else on, you know, underneath these to give a little bit more flavor. And then these just get placed right in the oven. Typical temperature range, usually about 350 degrees. Uh, you can go as low as 320 up to like 375. It really depends on how thick the product is and how short a time you need it to be cooked. To poach is to cook in a flavorful liquid that's at a temperature about 160 to 180 degrees. And when you look at a pot, what you really want to see is uh, no movement in the liquid, but a lot of steam coming off. So we're almost there here. And you can see a lot of the steam coming off with just very little bubbles. And then what we're going to do is actually submerge or place in the product in. So what I have here for you is some eggs. And we're just going to very gently place these eggs into the liquid. So with the poached egg, they'll take uh, at least about, I'd say, three minutes to upwards of about five to six minutes, depending on how done you like your eggs. You want to very carefully kind of take them off the bottom of the pan and then just pull them straight up. You can place them right on a dish here. Microwave ovens are powered by electricity and use microwave radiation to cook food. Meats, fish, poultry, vegetables, and potatoes can be cooked in the microwave. Microwave cookware is generally made from glass, ceramic, or plastic. Use only cookware with microwave safe labels. Never use metal in the microwave. It will conduct electrical sparks or currents and can damage or ruin the microwave oven. When you use the stove, follow these safety measures to prevent injuries or fires. Use pot holders when picking up or moving a pot or pan. Keep your sleeves short or rolled up so they are well out of the way of the burners. Turn pot handles toward the back of the stove to keep them out of your way as you cook. To prepare the table, begin by setting a placemat. With the plate in the center, place the fork to the left of the plate. The cloth or paper napkin goes to the left of the fork. Place the knife to the right of the plate with its blade facing the plate. Spoons are placed next to the knife. Put the teaspoon to the right of the knife. The soup spoon, if needed, goes next to the teaspoon. The water glass or cup is placed above and just to the left of the knife. If you use a bread plate, it is placed above the fork. Soup bowls can be placed directly on the plate. Before you serve a meal, make sure that your client has used the bathroom and has washed his or her hands. Dentures or bridges should be in place. Serving meals attractively helps make mealtime enjoyable. Foods with different textures, tastes, and colors make meals more inviting. When filling the plate, imagine that it is divided into quarters. 
use one quarter for meat or other types of protein and one quarter for carbohydrates such as pasta, rice, or potatoes. The rest of the plate should be filled with vegetables, salad, or fruit. Some people prefer to eat alone or only with friends or family. Always ask your client if he or she would like your company during the meal. Mealtime may be the only social contact your client has during the day. Unless there is another agreement made, bring your own food for any meals you eat at work. The kitchen should be cleaned after each meal. Keeping the kitchen clean helps reduce the spread of germs. Good nutrition and delicious food naturally maintain and improve your client's health. Your caring attention is valuable too, uplifting your client's mood and increasing his or her comfort. As a care provider, it can be rewarding to know that your efforts are contributing to another person's happiness and well-being.